Hi there, I'm the Myth Keeper. Welcome back to my channel. This week, we're doing the second part of our series on the infernal gods of the world of Pathfinder. These are all the evil gods, and this is our seventh, I believe, video on gods and goddesses in general. We're almost to the end of my whole thing on religion. We're going to do something on the Fey Pantheon and something on the Dark Tapestry as well coming up. But this video should be a lot of fun. Enjoy it. This week, I'm concluding my set of videos on the evil gods. As discussed last week, I've picked out 12 gods that I think are worth knowing about. Today I'm covering Baphomet, Zonkuthon, and Lamashtu, which sit at the bottom of my chart. I will also be covering Dahak, Achekek, and Glounder, which sit at the left of my chart. As a special bonus, I'm also going to talk about Rovagug, the rough beast, which was bound at the center of Galarian during the Age of Creation. Rovagug, the rough beast, is a god of destruction, disaster, and wrath. His symbol is a hungry maw, surrounded by nine insectoid legs. Rovagug has no holy scripture. He has little use for one. For his sole commandment is to destroy, and his followers need no instruction in how to accomplish that. The figurative and literal monsters who worship Rovagug share their myths and legends in secret shrines and hidden caves, calling him the rough beast, the imprisoned king, the tide of fangs, the unmaker, and the world breaker. They tell each other that each life they snuff out, each piece of art they destroy, each work of labor they bring tumbling down, puts a crack in the prison that holds their god. Each of their little efforts of destruction adds up, and will one day free him, setting him loose to bring about the end of all things. They tell of how Rovagug crawled millennia ago from beyond the depths of the universe, leaving only devastation in his wake. An endless number of lesser gods fell before him, devoured in his massive maw, or crushed beneath his unholy bulk. His worshippers whisper in anger of a cowardly alliance of other gods, who couldn't hope to stop him alone. While sly Callistria distracted the rough beast, foul Torag, weak Gorum, and judgmental Phrasma conspired to forge an unbreakable prison in the heart of Galarian. Arrogant Sarenray had the temerity to challenge Rovagag directly. She used holy fire to lure him close to the world that would be his prison before finally slicing a great rift on the surface that drew him in. Only then did cowardly smug Asmodeus seal Rovagag in the cage, taunting him with hell-forged keys. Still, his worshippers say this prison merely contains Rovagag, and only for now. He sleeps fitfully. His shudders cause the earth to tremble and mountains to fall, his cries of rage spewing noxious gases to poison his enemy's followers. His flesh births and sustains horrors undreamed of, parasites with the power to wreak destruction above. The deadliest of these, great spawns such as Festering Ulunat, the Unholy First, Chemnozit, the Monarch Worm, Zotani, the Fire Bleeder, and the Tarask, the Armageddon Engine, are almost gods in their own rights, laying waste to Galarian and leaving nothing but destruction in their wakes. They have caused catastrophes on a scale most of the Rough Beast followers only dream of, monstrous steps towards setting Rovagug free to feast on the gods who locked him away. While most of Rovagug's followers simply seek an end to all, his most extreme worshippers believe they will be uplifted as gods in a new world Rovagug will create after destroying the old. In truth, the Rough Beast cares nothing for them. He cares only about destruction and bringing an end to all things. Should the day come that his prison fails, he would after enacting his vengeance on the other gods, turn on his own spawn and followers, devouring them as surely as all else. Unsurprisingly, Rovigug's faith is forbidden in civilized lands. No temples to him are allowed to stand. The rough beast's worshippers revel in the hatred of other gods and their faithful. Creatures who take up Rovigug's service live to destroy. Most are monsters, or hail from communities that celebrate destruction. A few individuals, all somewhat monstrous in their own right, follow Rovagug in their lust for the power that they believe even other gods fear, or in the mistaken belief that the obliteration the god promises would clear the way for a new birth. Even they know enough not to name their deity in the open, however, lest they be swiftly cut down. Baphomet Baphomet, lord of the labyrinth, is a demon lord of beasts, labyrinths, and minotaurs. His symbol is a demonic rune that evokes a horned creature. First of the Minotaurs, Baphomet was born on Iblidos, the result of one of Lamashtu's vile acts. In life, he fathered numerous Minotaurs and led his people to secret places across Galarian. When he died, Lamashtu took his soul and transformed him from petitioner to handcrafted consort. Gifted obscene gifts to please her, Baphomet was a relatively weak member of Lamashtu's court, but nonetheless cunningly used them to get rid of potential rivals and over time accumulated magical powers. When he sought even greater favor from the Mother of Monsters, Baphomet raided Hell to steal Asmodeus's ruby rod. Unfortunately for him, he was caught, 
and Lamashtu denied relation to him. As punishment, the Prince of Darkness inscribed his own symbol on the Minotaur Lord's brow, with a nail of his index finger, and imprisoned him in a maze so cunningly crafted that Asmodeus declared it unsolvable. In this act, the Lord of Hell overstepped. The cunning Baphomet not only solved the maze after only a decade, he stole the labyrinth itself from Hell, taking it with him when he returned to the Abyss. Returning far thinner but much wiser, Baphomet claimed this new realm for himself, and with this act established himself as a demon lord. Baphomet appears as an enormous emaciated minotaur with feathered wings and a goat-like head that bears three horns, as well as a blazing pentagram branded into his forehead. Baphomet's cults are among the most prolific in Galarian. Human-dominated secret societies devoted to the Demon Lord are present in many cities, and may have members in sconce and positions of political power. Many Minotaurs also worship Baphomet as their patron deity. Knowing that most other Demon Lords rose to their positions through sheer power and intimidation, Baphomet is cautious around them, and prefers to destroy or turn them to his side with deception, seduction, or blackmail. He respects his allies, and is careful when working with more than one, in case their rivalries interfere with his plans. He has few enemies and not many rivals, and carefully plans not to have to fight more than one at a time. While Baphomet's devotion to Lamashtu is cooled, since his elevation to Demon Lord, he has forgiven her for abandoning him to Hell, occasionally reprising his role as her lover. But no longer as her servant, Lamashtu, in turn, remains fond of Baphomet, and sometimes intervenes when he asks. Zon Kuthon Zon Kuthon, the Midnight Lord, is a god of darkness, envy, loss, and pain. His symbol is a skull with chains running through the eye sockets. The Midnight Lord embodies and glorifies pain, shadows, and mutilation. And he is one of the most twisted and malevolent gods on the face of Galarian. Once known as Dubral, he crafted the immense star towers that still help keep Rovagug pinned to his prison at Galarian's heart, lending his own skill and ability to the great deific alliance to bind that evil entity. Yet a divine argument between him and his sister Shaylin resulted in the god departing for parts unknown. Zon Kuthon traveled beyond the edges of the multiverse and stared into the face of the incomprehensible things that dwell there. No one knows what he found in that place, but he returned, changed, but claiming to be strengthened by what he had endured. Likewise, the nation of Nidal on Galarian, which is bound to him, is a nation of survivors, founded by those few strong enough to do what they must so their people could survive the terrible aftermath of Earthfall and the Age of Darkness that followed. Zon Kuthon teaches that torment is the ultimate pleasure and sacrament, and that inflicting and enduring pain is the truest strength. Experiencing pain and learning to embrace it allows one to purge the weakness of their body and spirit. After all, much of mortal creatures' fear is rooted in the struggle to avoid pain in one way or another. If a follower can learn to embrace that pain instead, the chains of fear fall away, becoming a tool to be wielded. Worshippers thus endeavor to inflict as much torture and misery as possible on themselves. They look to the cruel outsiders known as chitons or velstrax for inspiration, including the use of spiked chains as a primary weapon. The anguish Zonkuthon teaches is not limited to physical injury. Zonkuthon teaches his followers to understand, overcome, and revel in psychological pain as well, breaking down morality and twisting compassion into numb pragmatism. This is best exemplified by his troubled relationship with his sister Shailin, who hopes to redeem him despite all evidence to the impossibility of this task, and his chaining of his own father, breaking the deity spirit, and transforming him into the hateful servitor now known as the Prince in Chains. Some worship Zonkuthon out of necessity, especially in Nidal, where veneration of the Midnight Lord is heavily interwoven into the culture and political landscape, and where deviation from this dark norm generally leads to tragic results. Outside those borders, some contemptible individuals gravitate towards a faith that allows them to embrace and practice their own sadistic desires. Still others find that Zonkuthon provides a level of understanding in the face of inescapable pain. To some, the bleak faith offers a means of finding release when faced with an inability to feel. Zonkuthon is cruel, but he is patient, willing to collaborate with others, and unlikely to provoke conflicts with other gods. He keeps to himself though one might argue that this is more a case of other deities keeping their distance. Likewise, his followers tend to keep their own counsel, perhaps seeming aloof to others, but they have no qualms about working with others to achieve shared goals. The god, his church, and his nation on Galarian all operate within a strict, unyielding hierarchy that followers understand and uphold, each playing their part as dictated by the Midnight Lord's teachings. Regardless of the worshipper or their reasons for following the Midnight Lord, his worship is terrible and merciless, often bloody and sometimes deadly. 
The faithful are often easily identified by their countless scars, many of them self-inflicted in the course of regular prayers, and frequently piercings and other body modifications, though tattoos are relatively rare among his followers. More profound, perhaps, is the cold, detached gaze of a truly faithful worshipper, their unflinching calm in the face of imminent danger, and their rapturous acceptance of any harm that befalls them. Though priests of Zonkuthon hold positions of power and respect within Nadal, they are few and far between beyond its borders. Somewhat more common are the more infamous shadow callers, who practice divinely inspired wizardry and other sorts of magic, and vicious itinerant clerics and champions who scour the land in an inquisition, seeking out naysayers and rebels. Lamashtu. Lamashtu, the mother of nightmares, is a goddess of aberrants, monsters, and nightmares. Her symbol is the face of a three-eyed beast. For those who revel in the corruption of the pure, or who find themselves spurned and neglected by a world that despises their differences, Lamashtu offers respite among her grotesque brood. The mother of monsters readily accepts mortals into her fold, and has made it her goal to twist mortal life towards her abhorrent ideals. Her intervention is widely known to inflict corruptions and terrible nightmares. Ostracized individuals who share her ideals will find this intervention a boon, while others treat similar events as horrible curses. Above all else, Lamashtu desires the proliferation, permeation, and dominance of her children. Her touch upon the mortal world reveals the repugnant flaws among those considered to be beautiful and moral. She and her followers seek opportunities to rip the veil of innocence from every creature and reveal the writhing, heinous potential in a hypocritical world. Lamashtu takes the form of a pregnant woman, with scars across her swollen belly. Great black wings protrude from her back, and her legs contort into enormous avian talons. A third eye is vertically set above her jackal snout. From Cornugia, her personal realm in the abyss, she reigns as the queen of demons and the creator of heinous beasts. Her children serve as pinnacles of might among her followers. Her faithful pursue her ideals to become or create ever more vile monsters and spread her murderous influence over the mortal realm. Lamashtu encourages her worshippers to embrace monstrosity, and may assist in this endeavor by granting torturous nightmares to unlock their minds the might and truth she offers. Their corrupted imaginations fabricate ever more horrendous images for Lamashtu to introduce into reality. Devotees sacrifice the flesh and bone of conquered beasts and their enemies to provide building material for their mother to mold new monstrous brethren, or to grant the gift of mutation to her faithful. Childbearing followers are able to directly imitate some of their goddesses' abilities. Bearing monstrous children for Lamashtu is regarded as one of the most sacred acts achievable within a religion. The mental and physical torment these worshippers experience during their pregnancies and the gruesome births they endure are sacrifices that earn them great prestige, should they survive. Worshippers with the durability to survive several births and who proudly bear the scars from them are honored by other Lamashtans and reign as the utmost authority in the faith. Lamashtan spread their goddess's doctrine via a variety of ways. Warriors protect the brood alongside their monstrous siblings. Healers keep their followers alive through multiple births and are talented in ensuring those wounds form atrocious scars. Caretakers with the strength to manage the church's monstrous children are rewarded with blessings by the goddess to aid them in their duties. Worshippers of all kinds are likely to venture into the world as missionaries, recruiting shunned individuals and forsaking communities to the benefit and prosperity of the brood. When those not among Lamashtu's faithful feel her presence, it is an omen of unimaginable misfortune. Communities subjugated by her monsters and demons may find themselves pleading with Lamashtu to spare them from her children's wrath. Expectant parents who wake in the night from traumatizing nightmares fear what horrors their offspring may bring. Lamashtu's obsessive creation of new monsters promises to reshape the mortal world into a sinister menagerie of vile corruptors. Her devotees join a family of all manner of demons and beasts with the goal to cultivate and glorify the loathsome. To the world that ostracizes them, Lamashtans offer this ultimatum, join the brood or perish under its might. Dahak. Dahak the Sorrow Maker is a god of dragons, treachery, and destruction. His symbol is a burning meteor. Dahak is the patron deity of evil dragons, particularly chromatic dragons. In draconic myth, there were originally two entities, the embodiment of law incarnate as an ocean of fresh water, and the embodiment of chaos, incarnate as an ocean of salt water. These events, should they be believed to have occurred literally, would have occurred during the Age of Creation. From the union of the fresh and salt water came the first dragon, a wild dragon god called Dahak. In his youth, Dahak rampaged across the material plane and destroyed everything in his path. Eventually, he discovered the plane of hell, and he liked it, 
and he made himself a home there. The salt water, taking the form of the dragon mother Tiamat, birthed six more gods, the beautiful metals. Dahak appeared before her and cast these young gods into the material plane, where they shattered into the first metallic dragons. Dahak hunted the first metals for sport, and only their distant descendants live to this day. The fresh water did not care for Dahak's destructive nature, and chose to attempt to end his existence. That water took the form of a radiant dragon, and named itself Apsu. He rallied the metallic dragons to fight against Dahak. As the battle raged on, Dahak wounded many of Apsu and Tiamat's children, until finally Apsu overpowered Dahak and delivered a near-mortal wound to him. Anguished by the battle between her mate and her son, Tiamat shed ten tears that landed on the graves of ten dragon heroes. The dragon souls entered the crystallized tears, which became the legendary orbs of dragon kind, which may be used to guide or even command dragons. As he lay dying, Dahak cried out to his mother, and Tiamat healed his wounds so he could go free. She also healed many of the wounded dragons, and they became corrupted by this into the first chromatic dragons, and in later battles they would fight in defense of Dahak. Another titanic battle followed, in which Apsu and the metallic dragons nearly destroyed Dahak and his corrupted followers. But Tiamat intervened again, standing in protection of Dahak and the chromatics. Apsu demanded Tiamat answer for her actions. Tiamat answered by denouncing Apsu for slaying her children, corrupted though they were. She savaged him and cast him out of the heavens. Today Tiamat is not worshipped on Galarian. All dragons live in fear of her, and none willingly name her. Dahak still resides in hell in modern times, and he is widely worshipped among both the chromatic dragons and any who venerate dragons or seek to acquire some kind of draconic ascendancy. Apsu is still around also, but he remains in hiding, fearing to act directly against Dahak, thus it prompts his former mate to intervene yet again. Achekek Achekek, or he who walks in blood, is a god of assassins' punishment in the praying mantis. His symbol is a pair of crossed mantis claws. While Achekek's divine genesis is a heavily debated topic among scholars, it is believed that he was created, either by the power of a singular deity or a group of them, created to eradicate those who would steal a god's divinity, and he has since become the enforcer of divine punishment. Known as he who walks in blood, he slumbers in the blood of heretics and worshippers alike, in a massive cleft carved into the base of the boneyard spire, a realm known as the Blood Veil. He keeps no formal relationships with any other deities. Even his sister, Grandmother Spider, who repeatedly coaxes Achekek to rebel against the gods and abandon his duties. Perhaps because of this, even though some gods disapprove of Achekek's methods, few openly defy him. Many of Achekek's faithful attribute the mantis god with a masculine identity, although Achekek himself holds himself beyond the mortal conventions of gender, just as he eschews ancestry in most mortal affairs. He does not actively seek worshippers, though the Red Mantis Assassin's Guild devotes itself to tenets curated around his persona and tactics. Red Mantises believe their assassinations are a sacred rite. Just as their deity stays his hand against rightful gods, the assassins do not strike against rightful rulers, but all others are fair game. Some ferocious druids and rangers worship Achekek to emulate the gods' efficiency in killing their targets. The deity's faith also attracts mortals who kill for coin, whether from a hope of someday joining the Red Mantis or at the direction of their own cults or guilds. Regardless of any association with the Red Mantis, priests of Achekek are expected to act as assassins of some kind when opportunity arises. This may manifest in an obvious opportunity presaged by an omen from Achekek, such as the sight of a mantis resting on the shoulder of a public speaker or a more direct message from one of the Red Mantis agents. Achekek's followers believe assassination for the sake of self-defense or vengeance do not require payment. However, assassins who kill for reasons that do not involve personal gain deserve appropriate compensation, at least in the eyes of Achekek's faithful. Glounder. Glounder, or the Gossamer King, is a god of infection, insects, parasites, and stagnation. His symbol is the mosquito. Glounder is a lover of disease and pestilence. His form resembles that of a giant mosquito, warped and distended by the parasite he hosts. He leaves malaise in his wake, laying waste to everything he can. Glounder revels in suffering, especially that caused by sickness, the last gasp of air into fluid-filled lungs, the terrorizing dreams that come only from the hottest of fevers. It is said that the Gossamer King was once swaddled in a cocoon, but was released by the curious Desna into the world with the cleave of her star knife. Since then, the goddess has pursued him in a dance macabre, hoping to kill him as they flit between planes. Glounder draws in those cast aside by their fellow kin. 
His priests are survivors of virulent childhood illnesses that left them changed and embittered, or those who have suffered gruesome tortures or terrible torments at the hands of inexperienced healers and wish to subject others to the same. He attracts misanthropes who wish to spread sickness, drawing from ostracized lepers, those injured and infected in war, and those riddled with pox. Glounder tasks his followers with the spreading sickness wherever they go, whether via an illness they carry themselves or a plague they introduce by other means. Those who speak of him with reverence do so in hushed tones, and their foes include the likes of doctors, midwives, and the followers of the goddess Desna. The adoration of Glounder's acolytes is disturbing to witness. They gather together away from prying eyes and wail to their god, bringing him offerings of rancid meat and fetid bodies, then infesting themselves with leeches and parasites. Glounder's desires are clear. He wants nothing more than to hear cries of anguish in the night, when he hovers in the sky, knowing those who suffer below him are rotting from the inside out. And that concludes our video series on the infernal pantheon of Pathfinder. Those are all the evil gods I'm going to be covering. Now, there are many more evil gods that I didn't cover. Uh, I just picked 12 that I particularly enjoyed, as I've discussed in the past. I've got some homebrew stuff kind of boiled into this, uh, which I apologize if you're just looking for the pure canon. Uh, but at least the description of all the gods that stay is pure canon. Uh, in any case, what I've got coming up next is the Fey Pantheon, and after that I'm going to be looking at the Dark Tapestry, uh, and then I'm going to be moving on to something else, something new and different. Uh, if you enjoyed this content here today, please be sure to like and subscribe. It helps me out a lot, and I appreciate uh, your patronage. Uh, I'll see you next week.